Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight. Uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by Adrian Davis up in Toronto, Canada. How are you doing, Adrian? I'm doing well. Uh, great to be with you, John. Yeah, thank you. My name is John Golden. I'm from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today what we wanted to talk about here is about building trust in sales, but also ethics in sales as well. So building trust and ethics in sales. So, you know, Adrian, you, you've talked a lot about trust in the past, you know, in sales. Like, why is that so important and, and, what's, and how does the ethical component come into play? Yeah, great questions. I, I think trust is critical today. Um, you know, a lot of the customers that I work with, they're facing commoditization. And so customers are basically deciding on price. And the only way to get around that is if you actually have a relationship uh, with your prospects, with your customers. And all relationships are predicated on trust. Right. And I think a lot of people don't really understand what what trust is and how it's built. And, you know, it's interesting that we're also talking about ethics. And I think a lot of salespeople in my world, they're, they're honest, mm -hmm. they're professional, uh, they're, they're good, decent people. And, uh, un, uh, you know, the uh, stereotypes notwithstanding of the used car salesman and all that. Uh, most sales professionals are very ethical, they're very honest, and I think they confuse uh, honesty with trust. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm honest, therefore I'm trustworthy. And yeah, there, I can understand the connection there, but I think in the sales world, John, uh, that's not always true. You know, I could have five salespeople calling on me, and they're all honest, right. but, but I only trust one. Only one is worthy of my trust. So what are, what are some of the key components to building that trust? I mean, what, what would make you trust one salesperson over another? Yeah, and I think this, this is really the, the critical question. And what I would say is um, customers trust salespeople when there's goal alignment, mm. that, that it's understanding the goal orientation of your customer and being very clear that you understand, and then you're on the same team. When customers are stressed, what they do is they close rank sure. and put a boundary around themselves, and they basically pull everybody who's on the same team close to them mm -hmm. and they push everybody else away. So salespeople have a goal. You know, they, they want to sell. They want to be successful in their career. They have a quota that they're trying to hit. That, that goal that they have could actually make them adversarial to me right. and trustworthy to me because they may do anything to get the sale that might not be in my best interest. Mm -hmm. And I think those salespeople that show up to say, I understand what you're trying to accomplish and I'm on your team. And I will even work against my own self-interest, short-term self-interest mm -hmm. for your betterment, for your goal achievement, because I understand what you're trying to do. I believe in it and I support it. And I think when we exude that disposition, that's what really builds trust. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I like that whole concept because uh, I'm I'm always saying to people is like, you know, you're not selling a service. You're not selling a piece of software. You're selling an outcome. Like exactly. When, when somebody looks to buy, when any of us look to buy something, we have an outcome in mind. And I like what you're saying here is, you know, for salespeople to really understand and dig in with the customer, what is that outcome? What is the ultimate goal? And 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 get aligned around that. Um, I, I I love what you're saying there, John. That's exactly right. That I have an outcome in mind, and the salesperson that can interact with, engage with me, and allow me to share with them this outcome, for me to get the sense that wow, you really get it. You understand what I'm trying to uh, achieve. You have the resources to help me achieve that. I believe in your competence and, and you're going to get me there. I like to say, say to salespeople that your biggest competitor is the status quo. Mm -hmm. I agree that, with that. Uh, ultimately, when people think that, you know, I can't get this outcome, you know what? I'll just stay where I am. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's this combination of understanding what is the status quo and, and what is the threat in the status quo. And how does the status quo work? What are the multiple systems that are working together to keep it in place? And, and, and how can we help our clients move away from the status quo to this future outcome, this outcome that this outcome that they have in mind? And so it's this combination of being clear on where they're going, 
being clear about the status quo and all of the entrapments of the status quo that are going to, uh, that are going to collude to keep it in place, mm-hmm. and providing that very clear transition vision to your client that, hey, I can help you get there. So how come, um, and th- that's a really interesting point about the status quo, and I completely agree with you. I think it is the biggest competitor out there oftentimes. Uh, and it becomes a place of comfort, right, for yes. a buyer. Because there's a lot of stress involved in making business purchasing decisions, right? You know, they can be career enhancing, career limiting, depending on how they work out. So how can, so if you're a lone salesperson, how do you, work with your customer, maybe all of the other people involved in the buying process, how, how do you get them to a point of feeling like they can move away from the status quo? Because like we said, it, it's a very comfortable place to be. Yeah. And I think that we don't actually do it. Mm-hmm. They have to do it. Uh, we can facilitate it. We can help them. We can ask intelligent questions. We can help them understand you know, what the status quo comprises. Uh, understand the different stakeholders and and why they may fight to hold on to the way things are. Um, But it's ultimately, it's something that the buyer has to do. Mm -hmm. And we often talk about finding the champion. You know, there's there's somebody who this change means an awful lot for them. And the outcome that they have in mind means an awful lot for them. And they need help in navigating the organization to make the change. And change, John, doesn't happen in in organizations uh, without these two things coming together. I call one the the, uh, outside insider and the other is the inside outsider. So let's say you... I, yeah, you and I are working together here. You're the you're the client, the prospect. I'm the sales guy. Mm-hmm. You're on the inside, but you've become an outsider because you're able to look at the status quo and see that it's deficient. Mm-hmm. Everyone else is happy with it. You know, right. they're they're in it. They're doing the day to day. But you've been exposed to something that causes you now to question the status quo, to be concerned about the status quo, and to want to move the organization away from the status quo. But you can't do it by yourself. So then I show up. I'm on the outside, but I I need to become an insider. I I need to understand exactly how the organization works, what the politics are, what the culture is, who the personalities are, what the history is that brought you to this point. And when I get that level of understanding, you and I can now work together to navigate the organization away from the status quo. But it's the, I can't do it by myself, and you can't do it by yourself. Mm-hmm. No, and that's a and that's a critical point that you've raised here, uh, because I think it's something that not everybody pays enough attention to. In fact, um, pipeline of CRM, we we built this feature into into the CRM deliberately because I think this idea of figuring out who's involved in the buying process, right, from a decision maker to an influencer to a naysayer to all these other roles. And I and I think you've hit on a critical point is we have to understand all the different roles. And yes, you, you have to find find your champion, but you also have to understand how do all these other people influence and what do you need to do or how do you need to equip the people maybe who are on your side to to sell to these other people, right? Exactly right. And also you need to understand when do these various stakeholders show up in the buying process? Right. Because not all of them are concerned with each phase of the buying process. Some of them some of them are going to be very active in the late end of the buying process. Others will be very active in the in the front end. Some will be active throughout the whole buying process. But I think when you demonstrate this competence mm-hmm. of dealing with the status quo, this increases trust. Right. Because, you know, let's say, again, you're selling to me in this case. Mm-hmm. My career could be on the line here. Sure. I, I could be proposing a change that infuriates certain stakeholders. And then, you know what? Uh, my, my days are numbered now, right? Uh, so if you have this uh, competence with the status quo, and you can help me understand some of the landmines that I might be stepping on as we proceed, mm-hmm. uh, it's going to increase trust significantly between us. Right. Because trust, trust is not just about honesty. Exactly. It's about, it's about competence and, and goal alignment. Yeah, absolutely, and delivering, um, obviously. And I think uh, what you're talking about there is if you can go on this journey with the buyer, uh, initially you're likely to have a very strong relationship going forward, right? 
Exactly, exactly. And today we're not, um, very few businesses today are just totally transactional. It's like, sold you something, right. I'm done with you, I hope I never see you again, and I'm off to sell more. You know, for most of us, we, we require repeat business. And I think for the salesperson to have this long-term view and to play the long game, mm-hmm. you know, maybe there's a bit of a sacrifice that I make in the short term right. where to demonstrate to you my commitment But over time, because of the trust that's built up between us, uh, this is going to pay dividends for me in spades down the road. So um, on the flip side, what are some of the mistakes that maybe salespeople make sometimes that can really erode trust? What are some of the landmines to be aware of? Yeah, Uh, I would say the the biggest mistake that I see and it's most most common is just, and it's natural as well, John, is just this Mm self-orientation. That uh, I view the world from my perspective. And so I see you as my prospect. You're my opportunity. And I'm walking in to give you my presentation. And the whole world revolves around me. And, and I really don't have the empathy to put myself in your shoes. So, you know, I'm going to subject you to my PowerPoint. It's going to tell you all about my company and how many offices we have and you know, how many secretaries we employ. And, and, and then I'm going to tell you about my solution and how great it is. And I think it's just the self-orientation that, you know, our prospects are looking at us and they're not engaging with us mm-hmm. at, at the level of intimacy that they could simply because we're not demonstrating empathy. We're, we're, we're demonstrating a self-orientation rather than an other orientation. So how can, how can salespeople develop a keener sense, a, a keener sense of empathy or a keener empathic approach? Because let's face it, it doesn't come natural to everybody. And, uh, you know, it's a difficult thing to achieve when you're in a pressured situation sometimes, which salespeople always are. So what are some ways that people can become more empathetic? Yeah, very great question. I think you touched a little bit on it to say not all of us have it naturally. I would say the best salespeople today, they do have, they're wired for empathy. They are empathetic. They're extremely curious and they're strategic in their thinking. But I think if one is not naturally empathetic, um, then it's it's just creating a, a process that forces you to think about the other person, to to orient yourself to the other's world. And so, you know, from your discovery, through to your presentations, through to uh, how you negotiate, how you submit your proposals, how you negotiate, that you've, you've threaded that whole process with a you orientation or an other orientation. And so I think if I lack it naturally, it can be embedded in the process. Mm-hmm. But by the same token, if you don't do it with, if you're not genuinely invested in 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 understanding the other person, right, it's going to come across at some stage, isn't it? Yeah, I think yes. Good point. So, so there are people who are not genuinely invested. There's other people who are just not naturally empathetic, mm-hmm. but they want to be. They genuinely want to be. Mm-hmm. So I think the process will help them. It'll have reminders and triggers along the way. But then, you know, if you're just fake, if you really, I really don't care about you, you know, I just want to sell and, and I'll just put on an act. Uh, you know, people are smart enough these days. A lot of people, in fact, who are buying, mm-hmm. they used to sell. They, they, in the old world, people had one career and they had that all their life and that's all they ever did. And they, didn't, they had no idea what other people did. Mm-hmm. Today, a lot of these senior purchasing people, they've been in sales before. They've certainly had sales training. Right. So they, they can smell a rat. They can sniff out uh, when somebody's being false. So, yeah, I think you're quite right. If you Maybe that's, maybe that's really where people should start is just a genuine concern mm-hmm. for customers and their prospects that I genuinely want to make you successful. And maybe that's actually the launching off point. The process can come later. Mm-hmm. Just having that heart of saying, I'm I'm here for a reason. You know, my business exists for a reason. I've been employed by this business for a reason. And and I'm about this mission. And I want to make the world a better place. I want to help my customers. Mm -hmm. I think to start there, John, is probably that's that makes more sense. And then once I have that orientation to then have a process to support me through 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 that. 
Yeah, I, I think I think that's fantastic advice um, because I think, as I said today, there's a lot of pressure on, on on salespeople today, and I do think that they have to take a deep breath and and invest that extra time up front, like you like you say, to really understand the, the goals of their prospect. And and let's face it, you know, as you said, there's a lot of pressure also on the on the prospect or the buyer. So it's investing that time up front, I think probably put both people at ease, right? Exactly, and you'll find as well that the, the sales cycles will be shorter. Mm -hmm. When you can get that level of empathy and, and resonance, uh, that what might, and, and, and competence in terms of dealing with the status quo, what might have taken six or nine months can maybe take three months. Um, and so I think for salespeople to get ahead of the curve, and you know, in, in Q1, maybe they've already done their number for the year, uh, certainly, that was my experience, and then that just takes the pressure off. Mm -hmm. And then every, every quarter, now you're you're seeking out deals where you really can make a difference, and you're turning away deals that they're not quite the right fit for you, and you know that. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to being in a position where you're behind the eight ball and you're desperate, and here comes an opportunity that is not a good fit, but I need it, you know. And so now I'm I'm being false, mm -hmm. and, uh, maybe being a little bit deceptive or dishonest because I just need this deal. Yeah. So it takes a lot of courage and, and honesty, really, to be the kind of salesperson who's able to do what you're talking about there is to walk away from the deal to say, you know, we're probably not the best fit for you. Uh, that takes a lot of courage, right? It takes a lot of courage, but customers love it. Mm -hmm. And I think if, you, if we, when we show up to, to somebody, if we're desperate, they can smell it. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, it, 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 courage and I think confidence just... Courage comes from confidence, and I think if we show up and like, okay, I'm here to help if I can help. So let me do a proper diagnosis, and if I cannot help you, I, you know, I know a lot of people. Maybe let me point you to a resource that can help you. But if I can help you, let me then share with you how I can help you. Right. And I think this, uh, I like to call it this sort of doctor frame, mm -hmm. where the doctor is in the house. Mm -hmm. And so you know, you, here you are, you've come to the doctor, I'm going to diagnose before I prescribe. And uh, I'm only going to prescribe what you need. Right. And, and I think customers can sense this. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it, it's just, it's like the little, tr little uh, micro expressions that we give off that the subconscious mind of the customer picks up to say, like, this person's for real. Uh, I don't know why, but I, I just trust. Them. They exude a confidence and a competence and uh, trustworthiness because they're they, they're not giving off a sense of desperation and that's a and that's a great analogy you use there the doctor one because i think this is a, a, a key takeaway for salespeople because prescription without diagnosis is malpractice right that's exactly right. <laughs> and that's what a lot of salespeople are doing they're sort of desperate it's like hey before you before you even talk i've got the answer mm -hmm. it's my product or my service yeah and it's like if you if you thought about that if you walked into the doctor's office and before you even spoke he said here i here's the prescription just go get these pills <laughs> i mean i would run right i'd be like whoa <laughs> <laughs> this is some kind of quack here. Exactly. All right, listen, uh, Adrian, this has been great. Uh, we're bumping up against the end of our time. What I wanted to do before we leave it is give you a chance to tell people a little bit more about yourself, about Whetstone, your company, and how they can learn more about you. Sure. So uh, Whetstone is a boutique consulting company that focuses entirely on the sales process and particularly the strategic selling process. So it's not transactional sales. It's really the transformational strategic selling. Uh, so that's what we focus on in the business to business world, primarily with manufacturing and technology companies. And uh, you can find out more. I'd probably just send you to my speaking website. I do a lot of speaking. Uh, AdrianDavis.com. A-D-R-I-A-N. Davis, D-A-V-I-S. AdrianDavis.com. Great. Listen, thanks again, Adrian. It's been a pleasure. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you for another expert interview very soon. Thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.